What, one of the interesting things, I guess, about me was that I wasn't absolutely sure I wanted to do computer science until I did it for the first time. I'd always had an interest in programming. I'd done a bit of programming, not a lot, not a lot of programming, but a bit of programming before I came to university. But once I started university, I really, really enjoyed it. I loved the programming. I loved learning about cool new data structures that just, for some reason, made the same job way easier than it was before. And, you know, um, and loads of cool stuff like computer vision and you know, uh, graphics, computer graphics and writing games and things. And, you know, I was kind of hooked after that. And then I started, you know, programming in my own time at home for fun. Uh, <laughs> question from me rather than the viewers then. Yeah. What, where, were you, where would you have gone if you didn't? Well, uh, yeah, I, I, considered a, I considered a degree in physics. I considered a degree in biology because I, found, I find life sciences and stuff really interesting. I have absolutely no idea. I think probably biology because I think, you know, the natural world's kind of cool. But... Um, but heck, I've, I've sort of found, found my way into the interface. You know, I do lots of plant, plant imaging and stuff like that. So I've kind of got both now. We have uh, asked for a few questions from some of our viewers and uh, I'm going to pose them to you if that's all right. Sure. Yeah. OK. So the first one is, how did you specialise? How did you get into doing what you do? So maybe we need a little line on what it is that you do first. Yes, yeah, I study computer vision. So that is taking pictures and trying to get computers to understand pictures kind of like we do. Um, now, my specific area is kind of more applied computer vision to do with sort of plant phenotyping, medical imaging, these kind of things. Um, so how I got into this, I guess, I guess it goes all the way back to towards the end of my degree. And I was deciding whether I wanted to stay in academia or I wanted to leave academia and go into industry, which, of course, is kind of the two choices I was posing myself. I was always going to stay in computer science because I really enjoy, you know, programming and things. But... Um, I, I sort of I asked around to try and work out what it was like to do a PhD and also but also it was quite important to me what was the impact of doing a PhD on my possible career in industry if I decided not to take it any further than that you know could I do a PhD and then get the benefits of that and then actually just go into industry anyway um, and the answer was yes you're not going to get three years of industry experience and move up the ranks but you're not going to get worse off you know I think and I think that some places really respect a PhD so that's always good as well. Um, so I just kind of started doing one, you know, and I enjoyed computer vision when I did it as undergraduate projects and I did it, you know, in, in the, the lectures and the uh, coursework that we did as an undergraduate. And so I ended up just sticking with that. And, you know, here I am. <laughs> I didn't leave after my PhD. That's the thing. And, I, and I'm still here. <laughs> Somebody's asked, uh, why would you want to do a PhD? Yeah, I, I, that was the same question I asked myself. A PhD is not necessarily what everyone thinks it is. In, in the very simplest terms, a PhD is a long, long project, a bit like you would do sort of for an undergraduate dissertation. But it's much more focused, it's much more in detail because you've got that much more time. And obviously the, the level is going to be a bit more advanced. Um, I think that if you enjoyed the project and the research parts of your uh, undergraduate degree, then a PhD would suit you quite well. Right? If you just liked the practical stuff, hands on building something, then you will do some of those things in a PhD, but you know, it's a bit more research oriented. Um, obviously, if you want to go into academia, then a PhD is going to be a, a, the first step in that process. But even if you just want to go into industry, a PhD will give you some specific skills like the ability to learn, the ability to write well-presented documents, and sometimes also to give good oral presentations as well, um, you know, because you do a lot of those things during the time. So you know, you'll learn lots of really great skills um, and of course, you know, if you're doing a PhD in computer vision or deep learning or something, you'll learn a lot about that specific area, which will make you a world expert in that area, which, you know, might be useful for wh whatever you want to do next. That brings on to the next question. So with all that learning and academia, how, how do you learn about different topics? Somebody's asked. It's a good question, actually, because I'm not absolutely sure. I think that it's practice at, I, I, for me. I think that when you're an undergraduate, it takes sometimes quite a long time to learn different topics. And so you can have to work, do quite a lot of revision for a given exam or something like that to really make sure that you know it. Um, one, I think a PhD, there's a lot of self-directed learning. You've got to read a lot of papers. You've got to take on a lot of knowledge very, very quickly. And I think you do get better at it. Um, and so now I can read, you know, papers or, you know, Wikipedia articles or news articles and pretty quickly work out what's going on. And I think it's just practice and experience. Um, so keep at it, I think. Uh, and it's a, it's a useful thing to have and it's something a PhD will give you um, because then you can, you know, do lots and lots of different computer files having learned lots and lots of different things. I know that you do quite a bit of deep learning stuff in your work. Somebody has asked how the architectures for these, you know, Google Net, Lenna, 
Alex Nets. How are they designed? How do they come up with those? It's a very good question. I think so. The general, the general way, most people hear about these because they get released in publications. And so obviously the question is about how do the original authors of those publications come up with some new architecture that does something a little bit different to what happened before that maybe performs a little bit better. Um, I think there's a lot of different things. Sometimes it's intuition and you know, you're an expert in something and you know that it works a certain way, but if you change it this way, maybe you'll see an improvement. And it won't always work, but sometimes you will see that improvement. AlexNet and Lenet, they're uh, sort of early examples of deep networks. So they were kind of pioneering, but in some sense also quite simple architectures because that's what we had back then. Um, more, you know, more recently, you know, things like... Back it, then is what, in 10 years ago? Well, yeah, no, not even that, sort of 20, 2012 to 2014 kind of time. So, so really, actually, this is all very, very recent. So you see a lot of new architectures because of this, because people are still coming up with new ideas. So maybe you've got some... You've got some data that you're trying to perform really, really well on, and you test it on some of these example al algorithms and, and architectures that you've already seen. And it works in some ways and not in other ways. And so you have to try and instinctively think, what is it that I could change about this that would lead it to perform better in these circumstances? Right. And then if you want to get a publication on this, then what you have to do is explain why it's better. You know, not only has it improved it, but also why, so that people can get some insight and maybe use those techniques themselves. So it's kind of a, it's kind of trying and error, a bit of intuition, and you know, it's a bit like normal science. You're basically throwing things into a test tube and seeing what comes out, I guess. But the test tube is a, is a, is a deep network. Somebody's asked, uh, what do you think of formal methods? Formal methods? I don't have a problem with formal methods. <laughs> I think um, people like Torsten do an excellent job on formal methods, and I steer well clear. Uh, I think they, they, you know, they're very important in certain circumstances, um, but you know, I don't tend to use them very often. Do you have any book recommendations for cryptography? Yeah, so I always recommend Ross Anderson's book. Ross Anderson's been on Computer File a few times, and his book's really, really good. He's currently writing, as far as I know, a new version, some of which might be available online if you want to check it out. If it is, I'll, we'll put a link in. Um, but you know, when, when it actually is released, you should definitely get that book, because it, it has a whole, you know, whole lot of information on cryptography, but also other parts of security engineering, which are really, really important. If you want a more detailed look at cryptography specifically and sort of skipping over some of the other aspects of computer security, then something like Cryptography Engineering by Niels Ferguson and others. Another option if you're interested in going sort of from the basics to some quite advanced cryptography is, um, is Introduction to Cryptography by Christoph Parr. Also, he's, his lectures are online on YouTube, so you should check them out as well. The question here about uh, how people in industry can keep up to date with what research is going on in academia. So some industries, they're very clued up to what's going on in academia, particularly those working in AI, because you have to be. Everything moves really, really fast. And actually, a lot of industry is producing papers and putting them into the major vision conferences, for example. So, so as an example, suppose you wanted to be, you know, you were working in industry and you wanted to be kept abreast of what the latest AI uh, research is, gonna, is going on then you'd want to be keeping an eye on you know, things like NeurIPS and CVPR and other big conferences where some of these big hitting papers are going to appear. Right? And uh, I mean, one of the downsides is they can, produce, they can publish thousands of papers. And so you've got to be able to be quite selective in what you read because you just couldn't possibly read them all. Um, so you've got to look for su subjects you're interested in. Um, and I think this is also true of most areas. So computer security has conferences and, and, um, and journals and so on that are going to release some of these uh, new attacks and new uh, explorations of security. And the, this is a place where you would read about these things. Um, so you just have to do a bit of reading around, get used to reading the abstract to work out if you want to read the introduction to work out if you want to read the results, you know, this kind of, kind of filtering system. Um, but this does work both ways. You know, from, acad from an academic point of view, one thing I've noticed is that we tend to, we tend to be a little bit haphazard sometimes with our software development, right? <laughs> because when you're doing research code, you're coding very, very quickly and one experiment doesn't work one minute and you've changed to another experiment and you just, no, don't worry about that. Some of the things that you have to have done, like proper testing and things like that, we, you know, we don't tend to worry about that too much in research, right? We will test, we will validate our approach, you know, on the data, but in terms of sort of robust, robustness, you know, for security, for example, I don't worry about that in my deep learning models because it's not important to my research. But if you were going to build that into a system, that would be more important. So some knowledge of how you would might go about doing that is going to help if you want to get industry using your academic work or you want other researchers to take it and run with it. You know, if your code is really, really difficult to use, it doesn't matter how good your paper is, right? People are gonna, it's gonna slow uptake. So actually I think some good industry best practice is gonna help 
uh, you know, especially when you release your code alongside a publication. So in your specialist area, image processing, what, what tools do you use? My work is kind of applied, so I'm interested in like, the whole pipeline from, you know, image capture all the way to uh, some decision or some, you know, some, some meaningful information. And so you know, for, for image capture, you are either going to use proprietary drivers from the manufacturer or I might use something like OpenCV, which has a lot of drivers for, you know, and, and can do most simple camera capture pretty easily and has a lot of, it's a library that has a lot of uh, image processing routines to do simple, you know, you know, fresh holding and segmentation and you know, edge detection and things like this. Right. So you can get things done quite quickly. Um, a lot of what I do now is Python centric. And so OpenCV works in Python. Um, and that also is where we do our deep learning as well. I use PyTorch, but, and, and, and a lot of our lab uses PyTorch. I think mostly just because it's helpful for us to use mostly the same thing because that way we can work together on stuff. But actually, you know, there are lots of labs using TensorFlow and it's, it's fine, you know. Um, I think you just pick one and <laughs> run with it. Um, if you know one, you know most of them, you know, in, in the way they work. So yeah, that would be where I get started. And then, you know, things like um, SciPy and things like these are gonna have lots and lots of algorithms for doing some of the other machine learning and stuff that you might want to do as well. What's your favorite cipher? We did a video on the Faisal cipher. Right? I think that's amazing. The Faisal cipher on its own, I guess, is not an actual algorithm. So I suppose if I had to pick one, then I'd pick probably AES because I think it's impressive how widely used it is. And it didn't come from a huge lab with, you know, with, with huge resources or a huge company like IBM. So I think that's pretty cool. But the Faisal cipher is the best. Potential controversy. Uh, where do we draw the line between national security and privacy? How long do we have? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I think that I'm more relaxed about this than some and less relaxed than others. So, you know, most of my family don't worry about this kind of stuff at all. You know, they'll install any app, no matter how many, many permissions it asks for. Um, I won't. But on the other hand, I understand that maybe governments have a role to play in preventing certain things from happening. And, you know, I'm kind of OK with that to an extent as well. So I think the balance we're striking at the moment is not terrible. <laughs> I think that, you know, we have some encrypted apps that they, they, they're not reading. Um, but if you're doing something really bad, they have ways, to, you know, to be able to work that out and prosecute you for that. Right? And I think that's probably a position I'm OK with. Um, but I don't think it's an easy question. I think that, you know, sometimes governments overtread and sometimes they didn't have enough resources and something happened that shouldn't have happened, you know. Um, so I don't have all the answers. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's kind of my opinion. It sort of links nicely into a question someone's asked about encryption and whether it has backdoors and whether we can trust things like Signal. Yeah, so I think you can trust Signal, um, not just because it's open source, but I think that it's unlikely that Signal's been, been compromised. And I think that's probably the prevailing opinion of most security researchers. Um, I think that from a business point of view, let's suppose you're running you know, a big instant messenger. Um, it's it's better for you not to have government backdoors because they are only ever going to be PR nightmares for you, right? Um, it's easier from a sort of legal point of view when someone does something bad on your platform if you can say, I couldn't possibly have read it, right? So actually, from a business point of view, I think they benefit from this end-to-end -end encryption. I do think that uh, governments would quite like backdoors in some of these things and probably ask, uh, but you know, whether or not they're granted, I, I doubt in most cases, but I don't know. But there was a suspicion of things like elliptic curve having backdoors. Yeah, yeah, we did a video on that and it probably was true. And then there was Logjam as well. I don't know if, I don't, did we do a video on Logjam? If we didn't, I'll do a video on Logjam. Um, very cool. But yeah, there, there are attacks from government agencies on, you know, standard uh, encryption and things like this because through that they can better perform their job, right? Now, sometimes people will think they overreach, right? That's the, the, the previous question I was talking about. I think in general, most attacks are done on end devices and not on the actual lines of communication between the two. I think if you wanted to hack someone, if you thought someone was doing something they shouldn't have been doing on Signal, it would be easier for you to hack their device or hack the device at the other end than it would be for you to break into Signal itself. And I think that's probably what they would do. So again, I'm going to sort of link these two questions together because they feel like they're sort of polar opposites. But what is the first project you're really proud of? And Conversely, what's the worst piece of code you've ever written? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important to note here that I write plenty of bad code, right? So does everyone. Uh, no one is immune to this. Um, I, I did once write a piece of code that I found later. Um, I actually t I tweeted about it at the time where it just said to do schema validation and I just left it blank. So it didn't do anything. 
uh, I'm sure it was fine. Uh, it probably worked. So, you know, that was, that was the researcher in me going, that's something to do sort of professionally later to make it tidy. But right now, my research code is working. I'll just, just, just not worry about it. You don't get jobs uh, in industry for acting like that. Uh, my, my, I guess the proudest thing, so I've done, I've done lots of things during my academic career that I'm pleased with from a software uh, point of view. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I wrote a, an implementation of the uh, early Stolk um, probabilistic parser, which I was really pleased with. So Dave's done a lot of videos on grammars. A probabilistic context-free grammar is one that has probabilities attached to different branches. And so there's quite a lot of computation to do with what the likelihood is of certain you know, ambiguous things happening. Um, and this was useful for part of my research. Let's, let's not go into it. But I had to implement this and it took me a good month or, you know, each day um, because I was working on my own. I, I wasn't familiar with the, with the literature. Um, but by the end, you know, I was really pleased with myself. Um, now, I don't know how long it would take me now. Hopefully a little bit shorter. Right, I've learned some things, but I don't know. It was, I, I didn't find, find it easy. Right, so I was really pleased with that. So how would you get started on a career in data science or machine learning? I mean, there's a few different ways. A master's isn't going to hurt, um, especially if that's the kind of thing that the jobs you're applying for are asking for. Um, but to begin with, I think you need to start trying to learn about, there are lots of online courses on this kind of stuff, and you need to try and learn about the standard methods for you know, traditional machine learning, feature representations, dimensionality reduction, cleaning data, all these kind of standard techniques that you're going to need to learn about and become very, very familiar with them by running through toy examples and, and doing this over and over again. I think, it, it, again, it's practice. You've got, to, you've got to practice these things, a bit like practicing other kinds of aspects of programming, um, so that you can do them quite quickly. And I think if you can demonstrate those things, you're going to be a strong candidate for a job in this area. Do you think that it's a good idea for IT specialists to pursue certification and to follow standards? Standards, yes. I think standards are very important. Um, you know, I'm not coming at this from industry, bear in mind. So, you know, uh, I'm an academic with a, a view into industry who's sort of making the best effort he can. Um, I think that standards are very, very important and knowledge, good knowledge of standards is very, very important. If that comes with a certificate, I don't think that's a bad thing. I wouldn't seek out certificates for certificate's sake in the sense that um, unless your job requires it, I don't think that having some label is necessarily going to help if you can already do that. You know, when I'm hiring people for an academic position, I'm really interested in what it is they can do rather than, you know, how many different things that you've got down on paper. You know, so um, if you can demonstrate that you can do something, that's going to that's going to be really useful to me. You know, even if it doesn't come with a certificate. Somebody's asked, do you think that encryption can always outpace decryption is that right yes probably i mean famous last words um at the moment we have encryption that operates in fractions of a second that would take you know trillions of years to decrypt so at the moment very much the, that's very much the case obviously i can't account for new weird types of computer that might appear but i i think so yeah i think that jumbling things up is easier than unjumbling them a bit like mixing paint right we, we you know we talk about this in diffie hellman and stuff there are some problems that are much easier in one direction than the other. And while they still exist, I think we'll always have a good place here. So I'm quite optimistic, actually, about, about things like this. I think that people's security is getting better overall. You know, we see breaches and leaks and stuff all the time, and it's very important that we deal with these. But, you know, 20 years ago, nothing on the internet was encrypted at all. You know, and all your passwords were out in plain text every day. Um, and we didn't bother us then. <laughs> we were fine. Um, but it's much better now. So I think we are definitely moving in the right direction. What's the best website to go to for computer security research? Uh, YouTube.com slash computer file. <laughs> I, I, I'm not absolutely sure. There's a few, um, my, my, I guess if you had to pick one, apart from obviously reading through Wikipedia, you know, which actually sometimes is, 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 people complain that Wikipedia, you know, it's difficult to source it and things, but actually a lot of their security articles are very good. So, you know, read those. So the Open Web Application Security Project or OWASP or OWASP, I, I don't know. It seems to be a, a kind of like a Wikipedia for security. Right? And I found that really useful and it has very detailed articles. So that's a really good place to go. And also you can follow the um, blogs of big you know, security researchers like Ross Anderson, Bruce Schneier and so on. Um, and they'll be highlighting you know, new papers, and new developments and interesting things in the news that have happened. So that's worth a read as well. What you want to do is move these things around and permute them. So if this is our data path with our columns, by sharing bytes around the different columns, when we combine it with the mixed column step, which we'll do in a minute, you'll see that actually we're mixing everything up. Uh, 
and it does kind of make green. This is a bit orangey. Let's not critique me too much. So yeah.